The exhibition actually began with discussions in 2014 with the Bodleian Library. They were at that point thinking of perhaps doing an exhibition on J.R.R. Tolkien, and then Morgan thought this would be something we would really like to help bring to New York City and to American audiences. It actually began in 2003 when the Bodleian hired the first Tolkien archivist, Catherine McElwain. The, Bod the Tolkien archive at the Bodleian is over 500 boxes of manuscript and paper material and over 300 volumes from his personal library. While this material has been at the Bodleian since 1973 and growing uh, since then with gifts from the family, it had never been thoroughly cataloged and processed. This was Catherine's job in 2003. By the time 2014 rolled around, she had completed enough identification of the material that she could begin to think about putting it together for an exhibition. That gives you some idea of the amount of material that she was dealing with and that is in the Tolkien archive at Oxford. Uh, can I have the next image, please, Emily? Um, we welcome you to Middle Earth at the Morgan. Uh, we created something of a little bit of a, a nice entrance to the world of J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, invite you to walk through Bilbo's front door and out into Hobbiton in the Hill to enjoy Tolkien, maker of Middle Earth. Uh, can I have the next image, please? J.R.R. Tolkien was born in the Orange Free State in what is now the Republic of South Africa in 1892. His mother and father had moved, uh, immigrated to South Africa from England for a better life and better job prospects. Tolkien uh, recalls later in life not being too fond of the arid, dry climate in South Africa. Um, but you can also uh, see something in this and keep it in mind for later um, objects. His mother's interest in uh, sort of in calligraphy, in decorative writing, in kind of augmenting the family photograph they have with these Christmas wishes and her own sort of uh, little drawing of the hills uh, in the land around South Africa. This is gonna be an important point uh, later on that comes up in Tolkien's life. Um, in the next slide, this is Mabel Tolkien herself, Tolkien's mother, and an important figure in his childhood, his first school teacher. She engendered in Tolkien a love of language and literature. Um, before he was uh, 12 years old, even helped him learn a little bit of French and German. Um, my mother did not do that to me. <laughs> um, in the next photograph from 1905, uh, actually that's uh, 86, um, this is uh, Ronald, a uh, young J.R.R. Tolkien standing with his younger brother Hillary at the age of two. This was about the time in 86 that Mabel took the two boys back to visit their family in England. They had yet to meet their grandparents. Arthur remained in South Africa due to his work, but was hoping to join the family in time for Christmas. Unfortunately, this was not meant to be. While the children and Mabel were in England, Arthur died from rheumatic fever. The family never returned to South Africa and stayed in a small village outside of Birmingham. Um, it was a momentous event in Tolkien's childhood when he landed, left the arid, dry climate of South Africa and landed in the green, verdant hills of England. It was a change that really imprinted itself upon his imagination and psyche, and it's one of the few biographical elements in his life that he states was strictly um, an influence for elements in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. And the Shire is a, a, a direct reference to the village of Serhole outside of Birmingham. Life in Serhole was idyllic for the young Tolkien. Um, experiencing nature, it was the foundation of his love of the natural landscape. Unfortunately, life was not always uh, kind to the young boys, and Mabel died from complications from diabetes uh, 
uh, when Tolkien was 12 and his brother was 10. Uh, this was an incredibly unfortunate event for the young boys, but at this point, Mabel had entrusted them to the guardianship of her, confess uh, her confessor, Father Francis Morgan. Uh, the two boys remained near Father Morgan in the oratory at Birmingham and stayed in a guest house. In the next image, we have the depiction, a uh, photograph. Uh, can I get the next image, please, Emily? Um, an image of Edith Bratt, a young orphan herself who was staying in the same boarding house as Tolkien and Hillary. Edith and Tolkien developed a fast friendship and that naturally turned to love. Uh, Father Francis was none too pleased with his young charge's uh, interest and uh, distraction from schoolwork. Um, he had forbidden Tolkien from seeing Edith until he was of age at 21, which was three years away. Tolkien loved his guardian and obeyed. Um, but the two, on the eve of Tolkien's 21st birthday, the two were reunited, and he was emphatic throughout the rest of his life that Edith was the love of his life. He made a statement in a letter to one of his children um, that, that boils down to, um, in, for marriage, you are companions in shipwreck, not guiding stars. You are complete equal partners. One of you is not the lead. One of you is not the guide. You need to be in this together. And that was his idea of marriage and his love for Edith, that they were complete equal partners. In the next image, we have Tolkien in his World War I uh, Fusilier's uniform. As with the transition from South Africa to Birmingham, the transition from Oxford to the battlefields of France during World War I was also incredibly important for the young Tolkien and formed a lot of, um, helped form a lot of images and material that would then also come out later in his literary work. Thankfully for us, unlike many of Tolkien's uh, school friends, uh, he survived the Battle of the Somme, unfortunately for him, by contracting trench fever and being returned to England to recuperate with Edith by his side. It was at this point that he began writing down some of the stories that would eventually become the Silmarillion, the history of the elves. Both as orphans, Edith and Tolkien were very interested in the security and structure and stability of family life. Um, in the next slide, we have Tolkien working in his study at home. Even though he was a professor first at Leeds and then Oxford, he did most of his work in a home study, so he was always near the family. The children were an important part of his daily life. It was in this study at this desk where he wrote lectures, graded papers, jotted down ideas for literary works on papers he was grading. Um, this is where his children gathered on Christmas uh, breaks in the evenings to hear the tales Tolkien was writing about a hobbit and his adventures with a group of unruly dwarves. In the next image, Tolkien's children, one of the most important aspects of his life, and he was never not involved in their lives. Um, as I said, they were the original uh, audience for The Hobbit. Also, over a 25-year span, every Christmas, Tolkien wrote letters from Father Christmas, in the next image, to his children. Um, this was an incredibly elaborate ruse that included even the postman. <laughs> Tolkien would produce the letters, pass them on to the postman, then a couple days later, they would deliver them straight from Father Christmas. When the children were young, this began about uh, uh, 1925. When the children were young, the stories were about Father Christmas's uh, home at the North Pole, um, adventures with his friends, the gnomes who helped him make the toys for the children. As the children got older into the 30s, the tales became more adventurous. It was at this point they were also hearing tales of the Hobbit. Um, and Father Christmas's gnomes become, uh, came to be known as elves. Um, in 1932, a group of goblins attacks the North Pole and steals all the children's Christmas presents. 
uh, Father Christmas uh, gets the presents back and uh, fights them off with the help of the elves and his friend, the North Polar Bear. Um, but Middle Earth starts to creep into the North Pole, and in the caverns in the central scene, right in the middle, you can see something of a, a figure with a shield and spear on a sort of dog or wolf-like creature, like a warg rider. This sort of creative drive for Tolkien um, was something that was, was a complete, um, within his own genius, an innate gift that he had been given, whether it's for children's Christmas letters, or in the next image, one of his early illustrations called Under Tennishness, which is a little bit difficult to say, uh, from the 19 teens. This is when he was in undergrad at Oxford. He was, had a uh, book, an illustration book, a watercolor book, called The Book of Ishness, um, with a number of illustrations, sort of, of abstract themes, um, fantastical landscapes, um, but things like this where it's under, this depiction of what it means to be under 10, um, this sort of very abstract butterfly yet landscape combination. Um, but this image of two symmetrical trees with like a path in between, some sort of journey when you're under 10, this idea of a journey that you're going on, again, is a visual depiction that will come up again in very well-known uh, works of art. Uh, later in life, in the next image, Tolkien turned his creative impulses more to sort of pattern creation and doodles in newspaper. There are, I think, over 200 sheets of newspaper with various doodles on them that he would produce while working the crossword puzzle, um, most, most of which are very carefully dated, um, and it's a very specific trait, but he would date most of his illustrations. Um, but this idea and this interest in sort of patterning, um, design, some of them are, are, are identified as visual elements from the second age of Middle Earth, the Numenorean age, uh, that he wrote very little about and only a couple of incomplete uh, fragments of stories. And yet here he is working on Numenorean ceramic patterns. Uh, there are Numenorean grass patterns. Um, but he's turning this sort of creative impulse, these patterns, into the material world of Middle Earth. The, the full creation of Middle Earth is both in the literary works, but it goes so deep as to work on something of almost like the material culture of that world. Returning back to the 1930s, um, The Hobbit began its life, as Tolkien says, probably about 1929. Um, with an idea he had and scrawled on a blank piece of paper in an exam that he was grading, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And he produced sort of a treasure map of a solitary mountain with uh, runes and inscriptions depicting this scene. In the next image, this is Thor's treasure map. This is the earliest version of the map that we have. The piece of paper with In a Hole in the Ground There Lived a Hobbit no longer exists, but this is one of the first pieces uh, in the archive related to the production of The Hobbit. Tolkien began telling the story to his children over Christmas uh, breaks, 1930, 31, 32, um, and it developed a little bit as the story went on. It was not written in a single break in one single narrative. It did grow over the years. So in the next illustration, you can see plot notes he has that are um, unfortunately a little bit obscured by the, the curtain. Um, but the character who had been bladder thin, uh, Tolkien decides his name really should be Gandalf. Gandalf the Grey. Uh, the character that was Gandalf becomes Thorin Oakenshield and Medrid becomes Beorn. And there's a note that says, let bear be enchanted. You see points in his construction of The Hobbit where the story changes and characters change. Bladderthin the Grey does not quite have the same ring to it <laughs> as Gandalf the Grey. And the story would not be the same if Beorn were not this fantastical, enchanted uh, uh, animal bear, uh, man bear. Um, you see like literally where the story is taking shape in the material in the archive. <clears throat> 
Um, for The Hobbit, famously, are the next illustrations for his watercolors for the first American edition, actually. The Hobbit came out in England in September of 37 with 10 black and white uh, pen and ink illustrations that Tolkien produced. Um, Houghton Mifflin, his American publisher, thought this was great, but the American audience really needs color. Um, they're, not, they're not quite as austere as the British, so we need, we need to have some color illustrations. So he produced, fearing what any American artist might do, Tolkien produced five illustrations that are now among the most famous of children's literature. Um, and the next one as well, Tolkien was never great at producing, at drawing people, at figures. They always have their back to the audience, or they are small or blurry. Uh, Bilbo is here resting under the eagle and is very vague in sort of his features. Um, but you can see from this what Tolkien excelled at was the depiction of the natural world, the mountains, the eagle, the cliffs, almost the air, the high mountain air and the, the wispy clouds and the mistiness is a real beautiful depiction. Um, he always uh, was never... Um, was very self-deprecating about his artistic abilities and never considered himself a great artist. But when you see the illustrations for The Hobbit and the other works that he, he produced for his own enjoyment, um, I think that that account of himself is, is quite um, invalidated. The next object is perhaps one of the most famous book designs of all 20th century literature, the draft dust jacket for The Hobbit. And again, here, much like in his illustration when he was um, in Oxford in undergrad, 20 years later, this symmetrical arrangement of trees and a central pathway yet again comes out. That idea of a journey um, that was sort of embedded in his imagination in uh, about 1914, again, comes out again in 1937 while working on this design for The Hobbit. Tolkien also designed the covers of the book under the dust jacket. So the first edition was really cover to cover Tolkien's complete creation of the story. Um, you can see in this as well, originally the sun on the front cover on the right side and the dragon on the back cover, your left, were supposed to be red. Um, Tolkien wanted them to stand out and to pop. Um, but in the days after um, World War I, the lead up to World War II, uh, four color printing was quite extravagant and excessive. And so the publisher has scrawled over here on the right side, over here on your left side, sorry, ignore red, and they've been <laughs> painted out in white. So you can see a little bit of the actual process that went into the production of the first edition of The Hobbit. And of course, this Dutch record design is still used on ones you can get today at Barnes & Noble in the Strand. What was supposed to be a sequel to The Hobbit, it, it surprised both Tolkien and the publisher in how well it actually sold. And so the Rainer and Unwin, um, George Allen and Unwin, sorry, um, was very interested in having a sequel and learning more about these adventures of Bilbo, uh, Bilbo Baggins. And so in the next image, The Lord of the Rings started out as The Magic Ring, More Adventures of Bilbo, um, that quickly changed and grew. And you can see here on this uh, preliminary, dust, uh, preliminary title page, Tolkien has crossed that out, written a little check at question mark, and then The Lord of the Rings. Um, he still was a little unsure of the title and what that might mean. Um, and the story developed very quickly away from a sequel about the length of The Lord of, about the, the length of The Hobbit and became the work that we know what it is. Um, what many people do not realize is that The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings manuscripts actually live in America. In the late 50s, William Reedy, the librarian of Marquette University in Milwaukee, was building a collection of Catholic authors' papers. And he wrote to Tolkien and said, we think it would be great if you know, if you were interested in selling this, we would love to have them. Um, Tolkien was not a fan of Notre Dame, so he decided to send his papers to Marquette. <laughs> um, for 1,500 pounds, 
in the late 50s was a significant sum of money, but looking back at that now and um, thinking what they might be worth, that is a remarkable, remarkable acquisition for Marquette. Um, in the next image, uh, this is the Tolkien archive at Marquette with the manuscripts for The Hobbit and Lord of the Ring, uh, his, and two of his short works, uh, Mr. Bliss and Smith of Wooten Major, um, all in their boxes and in their nice fireproof case. <clears throat> Included in this archive, in the next image, are draft notes of things like the timelines for the narrative of Lord of the Rings. As the fellowship breaks up and the narrative fractures into its different parts, Tolkien had to create graphic timelines in order to keep track of where the different characters and groups of characters were on the specific day, on certain days in question. And so along the right side, he has a little chronology. And then as you go across the left columns um, for the different characters, it kind of is explaining where they are in the narrative so he can keep track so they can all meet up at the right points in the story. This also helps him keep track of the phases of the moon and weather patterns. So when characters look up on the same night, they can all see the same moon. Um, more in terms of publication is the next slide of Tolkien testing out ways to depict the fire writing on the ring in a, a facsimile in the first edition and in subsequent editions that come out. Um, you see a little depiction of the writing that Frodo sees on the ring. And this is Tolkien playing with different fonts, different scripts um, of the Elvish in the Tanguar script, but sort of different fonts as we would in any PowerPoint presentation, flipping back and forth between Ariel and Times and <laughs> should we do Baskerville? Oh no, that's too much. So <laughs> he's trying to work out the visual depiction of the script. Um, and when Lord of the Rings came out, it also really astounded, um, again, the publisher and Tolkien with its success. And C.S. Lewis uh, stated in his review of the book that it is like lightning from a clear sky. Unfortunately for Tolkien, his life's work, The Silmarillion, was never published during his lifetime. Uh, the Silmarillion is the history of the elves, and really the work that he had started writing when he was a teenager, when he was undergrad at Oxford, when he was in the trenches under shell fire in World War I, he was thinking of these stories of the elves and how to, uh, how to, how to create this world. The next slide, East of the Moon, West of the Sun, is a poem from 1915, and one of the first uh, written down um, textual records we have of anything related to the history of the elves. Um, it is a poem based upon the character of Arendelle, who ultimately will become Elrond's father in The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Um, but Arendelle was really the first figure of Tolkien's mythology. He was inspired, Tolkien was inspired by an old English poem called Christ One. Um, I will spare you my old English recitation. Um, but the line is, hail Arendelle, brightest of stars, or angels, the translation can go either the way, um, given unto men over Middle Earth. And this name Arendelle stuck with Tolkien. Who or what is this? And it was a beautiful word. And around this character is when the mythology of, of Middle Earth uh, begins to form. The next image is one of the first depictions of Middle Earth we have in the Tolkien archive. This is the city, the city of the elves in Valinor named Kor, the great white tower with the two trees of the sun and the moon to either side that give light to the world. Uh, the poem and this illustration face each other in one of Tolkien's uh, blank books, one of his notebooks, um, and they really are kind of the birth of Middle Earth. This is 1915, um, and one of, it's, it's rare for a modern um, author or artist for us to have this sort of birth moment visible of when the literary creation forms. Um, and so it's a, a unique experience to sort of have this in uh, the exhibition. And I think one of the most beautiful moments when you see how 
clear from a very early age his vision was of what Middle Earth was and the city of the elves in Valinor. The description, depiction of this city do not change really for the rest of Tolkien's life. His, his faith in the world that he saw in Middle Earth was so clear and so distinct that this alone did not need any editing. Um, but I welcome you all to come to the Morgan Library and see this material for yourself and read more about Tolkien and the creation of Middle Earth. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now that we've had the, uh, the walkthrough of Tolkien's sort of overview of his art and his creation, um, we want to start looking at an aspect of him that, uh, that we haven't seen as much, and we should uh, be seeing a picture of him in his study. Ah, there we go, um, to start us off with. So it really is a great pleasure to be here tonight at the Sheen Center and to talk about Tolkien from this particular perspective that I'm going to offer tonight, which is one that's often overlooked, perhaps surprisingly so, and that is the perspective of looking at Tolkien as a Catholic and this is particularly meaningful to me. Um, I am a Catholic, I'm a Catholic convert, and uh, I think I owe a great debt also to Tolkien for inspiring me and to a certain extent um, in that I read his work. Um, I actually don't know when the first time I read Lord of the Rings was. I read it as a child, um, but in fact, I only have recollections of rereading The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was so much a part of my childhood. Um, and so much a part of my studies. Uh, I did my dissertation now many moons ago on fantasy and reading Tolkien and starting to ask where did the Lord of the Rings come from and then discovering that he was a Christian, golly, um, and discovering that he was a Catholic and then finding that um, this became even more meaningful to me um, when I became a Catholic and began to see really just how much Tolkien's Catholic faith meant to him. And this is a pretty good opportunity to look at that aspect of his life because the maker of Middle Earth exhibit already gives its visitors such a three-dimensional view of his life and work. It becomes a little easier for us to see the place that his faith had in that. Now we can see in this exhibit, um, as we've, as we've uh, had previewed for us, um, vignettes of his life, um, starting from his early childhood in South Africa to his student days, to his service in World War I, to his mature life as a busy academic and family man. Um, there are many manuscripts and artworks on display, and some for the first time ever. Um, and we see the, his own original paintings for The Hobbit, and some of the Father Christmas letters that he wrote and illustrated for his children, and even some of his early abstract paintings and his elegant doodles on newspaper crossword puzzles. So we find then, in this exhibit, a well-rounded portrait of Tolkien as a creative writer, as a visual artist, as a scholar, and as a family man. And what I want to highlight in my time with you tonight is the way that Tolkien's deep Catholic faith was at the heart of his life, and therefore was deeply integrated into all of his creative work. In a 1964 interview, Tolkien pointed out that in The Lord of the Rings um, and in the Silmarillion as a whole, Eru or Iluvatar, the one, is God. And then the interviewer, I think perhaps slightly puzzled, asked, are you a theist? That is, do you believe in God? And Tolkien replied very firmly and clearly, this is an audio interview, he, he replied very firmly and clearly, oh, I'm a Roman Catholic, a devout Roman Catholic. So he says that very clearly. This is very important to him to make that clear. He doesn't just believe in God, he is a Catholic. And it's worth noting at the outset that this can raise some strong reactions. Tolkien is such a widely read and deeply beloved author for Christians and non-Christians alike, and among Christians for both Catholics and Protestants, that to specifically consider him as a Catholic is sometimes taken to be a divisive issue, even sometimes an offensive one. For some readers, 
And I think for some critics, it may seem like a safer or, or more congenial approach to kind of sideline his Catholic faith as if, you know, maybe it didn't really play such a big role in his life anyway. And for a lot of non-Catholic uh, readers and for non-Catholic critics, and I don't think there are that many um, Catholic Tolkienists, not that many, um, sometimes it can be hard to understand the way that his faith would have been integrated so much into his life. And if you don't understand it, it's surprisingly easy to overlook the evidence of it. Now, one of the reasons that this has been relatively easy to do is that Humphrey Carpenter's biography uh, really gives relatively little insight into Tolkien's faith. And Carpenter's biography is very significant for Tolkien studies. It's the first biography, and so far it's still the only one um, that has benefited from completely unfettered access to Tolkien's papers. But Carpenter was not in sympathy with Tolkien's faith. In fact, he was doubly removed from that because, first of all, Carpenter was from an Anglican family, Church of England family, and second, Carpenter himself was an atheist. Um, he, in one of his interviews, he speaks rather slightingly of Tolkien's Catholic faith. And the selection of the letters, which is also edited by Carpenter, is on the whole geared toward Tolkien's literary works, especially the creation of the Lord of the Rings, rather than his life. And so, quite naturally, it doesn't include a lot of the references to his faith that we might expect from a more you know, collected letters. It has a particular focus, and it's not it. So we can see some reasons why maybe there hasn't been as much awareness of Tolkien's Catholic faith because of this early biography and the selection of the letters. But on the one hand, if we have some readers of Tolkien who are uninterested in or even hostile to this important aspect of his life, other readers sometimes err on the other extreme and present Tolkien as if he were a Catholic apologist or if his works were religious allegory. Well, he wasn't and it isn't. It's more complex than that. As Tolkien wrote in a letter, the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. That is why, he writes, that is why I have not put in or have cut out practically all references to anything like religion, to cults or practices in the imaginary world. For the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. So Tolkien's approach to putting his faith into his works is very, is very clear and very subtle. It's definitely there, but it's not there in an overt, direct way. His approach to what he calls the religious element is complex, it's nuanced, and it varies from work to work, but it's most certainly present. And as we hear in the exhibition catalog, Maker of Middle Earth, which you should all buy, it's a fantastic book. Um, you should definitely get it. No, they did not pay me to say that. <laughs> No, it's really a really fantastic book. Um, so the exhibition catalog um, notes that the driving force of Tolkien's creative aspirations was religious and more particularly Catholic. He wished more than anything to make England Catholic again, and in doing so to reintroduce beauty, purity, and love to his country. So if we are to understand the Lord of the Rings, and indeed, if we are to appreciate Tolkien's creative work as a whole, we need to get a more complete picture of him, and that includes his faith. So this story starts at the very beginning. Tolkien was baptized as an infant in the Anglican Cathedral in Bloemfontein, South Africa. He followed his mother, Mabel, when she entered the Catholic Church, making his Holy Communion for the first time at the age of 10. So for Tolkien, his becoming a Catholic would have been something that he remembered consciously. Obviously, he wouldn't have remembered being baptized as an infant, but he would have remembered his first Holy Communion. And especially 
his mother's faith, his mother's conversion was very important to him because it was her conversion to Catholicism that led to a very dramatic change in their lives because her family did not approve and they cut her off completely. And it was this complete cutting off by her family that left Mabel and her two sons in such poverty. And Tolkien knew that and so he was very aware that she could, have, she could have renounced her Catholic faith and, and perhaps saved her life with better medical care. Uh, she did not. This was his first and most powerful witness about following Christ and the cost that that takes. And that was a witness that stuck with him through his whole life. So he became um, an altar boy at the Birmingham Oratory. Um, and there, that's, he was under the guardianship of Father Francis Morgan. Um, and after he was orphaned, this uh, Father Francis Morgan, Catholic priest, one of the Oratorian priests, um, looked after him. Um, and indeed, this, this only <coughs> was uh, learned recently, not only was his guardian and guided him and advised him and basically kept, kept his nose to the, to the grindstone, um, but also supported him financially to a very considerable sum in his studies in Oxford, and did it so quietly that no one knew about this until a recent uh, biographer um, turned it up in a book called Uncle Kuro. Uh, so he really supported, Father Francis really supported Tolkien um, in, his, in, his, uh, in his scholarly studies as a, as a young man. And Tolkien um, had a great respect and admiration for Father Francis. And he retained that throughout his life. And in fact, Father Francis became a lifelong family friend um, of the whole Tolkien family, Tolkien and his wife and his children. Um, and it's interesting because I, I think Tolkien understood the reasons why um, Father Francis had forbidden him to see Edith. It wasn't that, that Father Francis had any particular objection to Edith as Edith. It was that Tolkien was a very distractible young man. He admits this in his letters. He would catch sight of a new language and boom, he'd be, he'd be studying Finnish and Gothic when he should have been preparing for his entrance examinations. And here's the thing. As a penniless orphan, Tolkien had to get a scholarship to go to Oxford. Otherwise, he could not have gone. And with no family support, what would the, this young man have done for a living? He was clearly well suited for the academic life. Father Francis could see that he was brilliant and scholarly, but in order to have that career, he had to get to Oxford and he had to have a scholarship. And if he was gonna get that scholarship, he had to study. And if he's gonna study, he couldn't be distracted by a girlfriend. <laughs> and I think that's why, even though it was very difficult and painful for Tolkien to have this separation, he accepted Father Francis's guidance, I think not just because he respected his guardian, although he did, but also because he knew that it wasn't blind or random, that it really was with his welfare in mind. And then um, Father Francis actually volunteered to marry them. Um, and as it turned out, at that point, Tolkien had made um, other plans um, for them, for he needed to be married um, with a different priest. But it just goes to show that that bond remained um, you know, even through this difficult time. So this is a very important figure in his life. So Tolkien was a regular mass goer throughout his life, and in the exhibit we have a little glimpse of that in a 1914 letter to his future wife, Edith, um, which is included in the exhibition catalog. And in this letter, he tells Edith about officer train maneuvers on Port Meadow in Oxford, and he goes on to add the next day I got up at 7.40 a.m. and just reached church on time and went to communion. And in this little reference, we see a glimpse of Tolkien's faith in practice, that he was getting up in the morning um, and getting to mass and receiving Holy Communion, um, and this is part of his regular routine of his life and would be throughout his life. His granddaughter, Joanna, uh, mentions him closing a letter to her with, God bless you, your loving grandfather. And she remarks that shows one of his basic values, his profound belief in God. Clyde Kilby, uh, who assisted at the preparations, attempted to assist at the preparation of the Silmarillion in the last years of Tolkien's life, Clyde Kilby remembers him as a devout Catholic and recalled that in conversation with Tolkien, 
every single day he would get on to scriptural things. And that Tolkien would just fling out these things, talking on the phone with a priest friend. I heard him say at the end of a conversation, well, may the Lord bless you in the most sincere feeling tone. Tolkien's friend and fellow inkling, H.E. Havard, recalled the depth of feeling behind his Roman Catholic religious convictions, noting that these convictions were apparent but never paraded. And there are many small details that help to give a picture of Tolkien as a Catholic. He translated the book of Jonah for the Jerusalem Bible, and he was very interested in the life of St. Thomas More. He described R.W. Chambers' biography of More as overwhelmingly moving. And he wrote in his letters of the personal importance to him of prayer and the Eucharist. He knew by heart and frequently used a selection of Catholic prayers in Latin. And even some of these, including the Lord's Prayer, the Hail Mary, and some of the Litany of Loretto, he translated into one of his Elvish languages. A reference in a 1944 letter to Christopher shows that Tolkien participated in the 40 Hours Devotion, which is um, a devotion of adoration to the Blessed Sacraments held in this instance um, in 1944 at the Church of St. Gregory and St. Augustine in Oxford. And it is indeed at this um, Eucharistic adoration in this church um, that Tolkien had this vision um, of God in, in Eucharistic adoration that's recounted in one of his letters that's in the published letters. So it was at St. Greg's um, during Eucharistic adoration that we have this, this moment that he has a, this, this um, tremendous and tremendously moving vision of God. And indeed, Tolkien had a special reverence for the Blessed Sacrament, and he writes to his son Michael that it is, he says, the one great thing to love on earth. Tolkien also had a deep love for Our Lady, the Virgin Mary, and he describes her as being the source of all of his sense of what is beautiful and majestic. He had a special devotion to St. John the Evangelist, and also had a special fondness for St. Bernadette, whom he described as that child of grace who is nearest his heart. Now, Tolkien's faith shaped him in no small part because it was not compartmentalized. It was not just something on his to-do list on Sunday mornings. It was not just a, a lifestyle choice, like the fact that he, that he was willing to use a typewriter, unlike, say, his friend C.S. Lewis, who abhorred typewriters and only stuck with a dip pen throughout his whole life. Now, following Christ is not easy, and Tolkien knew that. He wasn't a Christian just because it was a lifestyle choice. Rather, it was at the heart of who he was. Now, Tolkien knew suffering intimately, losing his father as a young child, losing his mother as a boy, growing up in what he recalled as considerable poverty. Then, as a young man, his world was shattered by the First World War. He served on the front lines, where he became seriously ill with trench fever, which very likely weakened his constitution permanently. He suffered from chronic illnesses throughout his life, was very susceptible to any cold or anything like that. His constitution was very weakened by the trench fever that he contracted as a young man in the First World War. In that war, most of his close friends were killed. Yet Tolkien did not become bitter, but rather throughout his life, despite the very real suffering that he had experienced and continued to experience, he embodied joy, a joy that was all the more real for the fact that he knew its opposite. Tolkien knew very thoroughly the demands as well as the rewards of marriage and the demands and rewards of family life. His marriage to Edith, his first and great love, was faithful and lasted for 55 years until her death. They raised three boys and a girl. And all four of those children attended Oxford University. It's notable Tolkien was just as supportive of his daughter Priscilla's education as that of her brothers. There was no narrow-mindedness there. His eldest son, John, became a priest. Another son, Christopher, served as an RAF pilot in World War II, one of the most dangerous combat roles 
His third son, Michael, recalled that for both himself and his three siblings, Tolkien retained a close interest in every detail of our lives up to the date of his last illness, and that his father had the gift of combining fatherhood with friendship. Tolkien's writings bring delight to countless readers, and I would say they do so in no small part because they spring from a genuinely, thoroughly healthy, and genuinely and thoroughly virtuous soul. Tolkien's faith was a vital part of his life, and indeed a key element of his creativity, both shaping and helping to direct his imagination. And indeed, he was explicit about the theological foundation of his creative work. In his great essay on fairy stories, he writes that we make in our measure and in our derivative mode because we are made and not only made, but made in the image and likeness of a maker. He recounts in that same essay that the great happy ending, the, the, the feeling of joy to happy ending, is so joyful because it is an echo, a faraway echo of the great happy ending of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. So in the very structure of the story of something like the Lord of the Rings, we have what Tolkien calls the eucatastrophe, the good catastrophe, um, which for him was an echo, a foreshadowing, and a, and a reimagining of the resurrection. So there we have it right at the heart of his creative work. And we see in Tolkien's life, a life lived faithfully, striving to do with God's help all that he was called to do as a teacher, as a colleague, a writer, a husband, a father, and a friend. By his own admission, he sometimes failed. But even here, in his own admissions of failure, we can see Tolkien's essential humility and his openness to the workings of grace. In this weary postmodern age, we tend to be skeptical of saints. We tend to be skeptical of heroes. And we can be a bit chary of praising man's character. Frankly, so often we expect to be disappointed. But Tolkien is a rebuke to our cynicism. Now, he's no saint, if by a saint we mean someone who's perfect in every way. Of course not. <laughs> but as we trace the course of his life, as this exhibit helps us to do, it's impossible not to recognize that we're in the presence of someone very special. Tolkien was need a true genius and his creative achievements will perhaps never be surpassed, especially not in their sum total as, as a genius in academic, linguistic, writerly, and visual arts. As varied and disparate as the elements of his life might seem to be, though, Tolkien was a deeply integrated man. And it was, I would suggest, his Catholic faith that unites all of these different parts of his life into one unified, deeply meaningful, and inspiring whole. Thank you. So now we come to the part of the uh, session that I've been really looking forward to, which is the chance to have some discussion. Uh, and I hope you guys will uh, be able to stick around for a little bit and join us in that. Uh, we're going to have a, a microphone over on that side, I think. Uh, so if you have some questions that you would like to ask, you'd like to hear us uh, discuss, I wanted to uh, invite you in a few minutes to sort of queue up by the microphone. And we'd love to, uh, to interact with as many of you as we have time for here. Um, but uh, I, I just. Yeah. I'll begin with a few questions of my own. Um, you. Okay. John, you were speaking about his uh, visual work, which of course, I, mean, I know for me, it's one of the things that I'm most excited about, about the exhibit, the opportunity to be able to look at some of these originals and really, really kind of get, get close to them and, and see them after having seen reproductions uh, for so long. Um, what would you say, uh, you know, 
obviously, you know, most of us know Tolkien as a writer primarily and think of Tolkien first and foremost as a writer. Many people are, aren't even really aware of the, the role that the visual arts played uh, in Tolkien's life. Tell us some more about what we can learn about Tolkien as a visual artist from the exhibit. Um, well, I think one thing is that when he said that he wasn't a very good artist, um, he was incorrect. Uh, you will see in illustrations in the show and in those that are published, um, he had an, a, a beautiful and gifted visual mind, uh, both for the illustrations for The Hobbit that um, I showed that are sort of uh, very uh, kind of professional level uh, for publication, for everyone to see illustrations. The illustrations he made for Lord of the Rings are not for publication. They were for his own benefit while writing. And as he was getting to a scene in Lothlorien or when Frodo comes to Barad-dûr, he would start to write it, then he would turn to draw the scene um, back to writing. It was sort of the creation of that setting for him was both a textual and visual process. And so for, for his, his writing process, the creation of Middle-earth was sort of hand in hand uh, visual and textual creation. Um, but he, he for, at least for Lord of the Rings, um, very famously said, I began with a map and made the story fit. Um, so the visual creation is not only in sort of drawing a forest or drawing a dark tower, it is in literally creating the world that the narrative takes place in. Um, the map, or the first map of Lord of the Rings that we have in the show is the one that he produced about 1937 when he started working on the magic ring um, and used up until the work was ready for publication about 1950. Um, it is a well-loved and well-used document. Um, he redrew parts, he had to overdraw. There are, when the pencil faded, it gets inked over. There are little bits that, um, there's a new scrap of paper taped on and that part of the geography redrawn, either to clarify um, or to cover up a, a sort of worn place or a tear. It's fraying at the edges, it's been like, like a Rand McNally road atlas, folded and refolded and unfolded and misfolded um, over the 12 years of writing Lord of the Rings. It is a very used document. Um, but it also shows that his visual world and the visual creation was so deep, so uh, crystal clear in this world that he was I think he, he probably would not like the, world, the word inventing, but he always sort of described his writing process, particularly for Lord of the Rings, as more of a discovery. It was something that was already there and he was just uncovering or discovering it. It wasn't uh, invention in the same uh, uh, way that um, fiction is normally described. Um, and so you see throughout his, his entire process that um, the visual aspect of, of, I mean, the greatest part of his life, um, both the stories, his children's lives, um, has a very, a very strong visual aspect to it. And I think um, a lot of these, um, as Holly said, a lot of the documents have not been published before or been on public view. And so people are gonna be very surprised to see um, Tolkien as artist. Um, and that's both seeing the original documents. Um, no, no reproduction here or in a book does justice to the Hobbit watercolors. Um, they are, are jewel-like in their coloring. It's, it's quite outstanding. Um, but also when you see the drawings he made as a 10-year-old, um, as a student at Oxford, where he is experimenting, they're very modern, they're, they're bright, vivid, almost jarring colors um, in abstract patterns. You, if, you, if you think at all about Tolkien as artist, you're probably like, oh, he must be very antiquated or 
um, you know, looking back at like the Victorian era or, or medieval, very little pictures of, of nothing. And yet they're like surprisingly modern, right. um, which I think a lot of people, uh, it, is, um, it is startling to realize this other half yeah. of, of him as creator. Yeah, the, the element that I found most moving uh, uh, in your slideshow uh, was that that diptych between the Valinor poem, the early Valinor mm -hmm. poem, and that image, right, of Kor uh, and, and the trees. And that just seems to me such a wonderful example of what you're, of what you're describing there, the way that his imagination really, it wasn't just that his paintings were an offshoot of his imagination or something, it was a very fundamental part of his imaginative process. And you can sort of see that poem and that image yeah. as like those, that is his his process, right? right? Yeah. And and both of those, you know, it's not. And now I'm going to do. I'm, now I'm going to illustrate my poem, right? No, like the 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 image itself is as much a part of that subcreative process for him. It was uh, it was his poem. life, like that's. Yeah. And even on vacation, he would uh, do a, do a painting of the seaside that he and uh, Edith and the children were at, and then turn the page and draw. Um, uh, the the land of the elves in the west and the land the the mountain where the the Valar the gods uh, live uh, the halls of Manwe and the world above fairy um, so this sort of uh, illustration whether for fun or for um, the 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 literary side um, was always a, a very important and strong part of his life absolutely yeah and of course it's one of the things also that helps to explain and a lot of people who are not Tolkien fans will often say things like, okay, The Lord of the Rings is all right, but like, come on with the landscape descriptions for crying out when we get on with it, you know? But yeah. you can see even there, right? This is, he's, he's describing what he sees, right? And, and that visual imagination of, of you know, of all of these different scenes and landscapes and, and, and parts of the world as he's discovering them, right? That's, yeah. that's what he's trying to convey in prose so often as well as, and occasionally capturing it in yeah. watercolors as well. So that's, that's uh, really this, the, the thing that excites me most about uh, the exhibit is the opportunity to, to kind of get to see that more. Um, well, Holly, I wanted to uh, follow up uh, with you. I was especially interested, one of the things that uh, I really wanted to draw attention to, one of the quotations that you made, uh, which I think is so often misunderstood because it seems so counterintuitive at first, right? Um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with Tolkien readers over the years, and, and I've met people who will say, you know, people talk about Tolkien as a Christian writer, but, you know, like, I, I, I'm skeptical, right? And usually the reason that people cite for their skepticism about how really serious Tolkien was as a Christian is that God is almost never mentioned in The Lord of the Rings, right? And it's completely submerged. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of draw attention, as you were drawing attention to it in your talk, again to the fact that Tolkien explained that he does not describe, he suppresses references to religious practices in the story because it is a deeply Christian work. Like, that's why he suppressed it, uh, which seems counterintuitive. Its absence is what often makes people wonder whether he really was serious or not. I, I just, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about sort of how that works and what that kind of uh, gives us as far as helping us to understand a little bit more about what Tolkien meant when he called it a, a fundamentally Christian and Catholic work. Yeah, it's an interesting question because it's complex and Tolkien himself says different things at different times to different right. people about it. And I think that, and that has given rise to a lot of debate. Um, but it's, I think the reason that he it says these different things about it is that it's complex and there are different ways of looking at it, even for Tolkien himself. Right. Um, but I think the quote that I had in, in my talk really is one of the most important ones because there he addresses the paradox head on right. that it's fundamentally a Catholic work, it's fundamentally religious and Catholic, unconsciously in the drafting, right. consciously in the revision, which you might think would be the other way around, but no. And then he says, and that's why he cut out all the overtly religious bits. And you think, what, did he, did he say that the wrong way around? No, 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 he says that's why he's cut them all out. Um, and if you think about it, one of the things it means is he doesn't invent false religions. No one, no one in 
none of the heroes is worshiping false gods. There is one God. And Tolkien's very clear in interviews that the God of Middle Earth is God. Um, it's not an imagined deity. Um, the Valar are archangelic figures, um, and and you know the archangels are angels are messengers. They're um, you know beings who do God's will and carry His messages. There you go. There's Gandalf. So he's clearly got this imagined structure, and everything in Middle Earth is consistent with um, Christian theology. And that includes, by the way, sometimes people will raise as a question, what about the reincarnation of the elves? Because um, human beings do not reincarnate. That's, that's a dogmatic point. Um, but elves are not humans. And Tolkien is making a very clear distinction. You know, it may be that for the elves, within the created order, they may, God made them so that they reincarnate. Now, that isn't gonna last forever. That only lasts as long as the created order lasts. Even the elves don't know what happens after that. Um, so he's very consistent. Because he's so tremendously imaginative, he's, he kind of goes the step further um, in making it consistent. But I think the more interesting question is, how is it that the Lord of the Rings um, is so fundamentally Christian? And I think that gets to what I, what I just briefly touched on from uh, on fairy stories. Mm -hmm. It's that he has taken it and brought it so deep into it that the Christianity of it is at the level of theme and story and image. Um, and that's just a different way of doing it. So his great friend C.S. Lewis took a different approach in, you know, for instance, the Narnia stories. Um, and it's just a different way of doing it. Um, right. Tolkien's doing it in this very implicit, implicit way. Um, and once you see that, you can start to recognize the way that it comes out. So for instance, um, in, if you look at the Narnia stories, you have one clear Christ figure, you have Aslan, and you see Aslan in, in different modes and in different stories. Um, but in The Lord of the Rings, you have multiple Christ figures. So we have, for instance, Frodo is a Christ figure, very much so, both Frodo and Sam, um, as Christ the suffering servants. Um, suffering broken on the way to Mount Doom. That's very much a you know, passion of the Christ moment as he's literally broken, um, falling um, on his way to, to his, final, his final suffering. We have um, Gandalf is a resurrected Christ figure. He dies to save the fellowship and he is reborn. We have Aragorn who is a Christ figure. Aragorn is Christ the king. And Christ the King is also Christ the Healer, which Aragorn is. Um, so we have not one Christ figure. We don't have one character who is Christ in all his aspects, but we have sort of different facets of who Christ is seen through these different characters in different ways. And so once you realize that, you see, ah, yes, you know, Aragorn really shows me something of what it means for Christ to be the King. Um, and, and Frodo shows what it means to be Christ the suffering servant. Um, and that's part of the way that he makes it implicit. Yeah, it's, it does seem that one of the problems that a lot of readers get uh, is they're, they're, they're looking for Aslan, right? They're looking for the, you know, and I, I've had lots of conversations over the years, <laughs> you know, that started with, well, no, Gandalf isn't actually Jesus. You know, it's not, it does, it's, it's, it's more come, but as you say, it's not that that's wrong. It's just that you, there is not that, that that's not the way it operates. Right? I think back to um, his uh, his famous comment, of course, in the in the preface to the second edition of the Fellowship of the Ring, where he talks about allegory and applicability and mm -hmm. um, the freedom of the reader instead of the purposed domination of the author, which is a, 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 a perhaps a slightly strong way of talking about it. Um, but it, it's one of the things that I always find very striking about. The, the, the symbolism of the Lord of the Rings is that freedom that he allows. There's a, there's a kind of humility, mm. I think, in Tolkien's storytelling where he, is, he doesn't show any anxiety about whether or not, like, not in the storytelling itself, in his letters sometimes, but not in the you know, storytelling itself, any anxiety about people taking it the wrong way. He leaves readers free to apply it in various ways and to relate to it in, in, in different ways. Um, 
which, of course, I think is one of the reasons it has had such a, a broad and enduring appeal to so many people. Um, but even his, uh, even his, his you know, the, the Christian symbolism that he talks about, thinking about consciously, he doesn't, he doesn't draw you to it. He doesn't force you to it. And if you, if you, if you, if you never notice it, if it never strikes you, he leaves it there. You know, he doesn't ever come back and be like, now, <laughs> you know, the story doesn't kind of push you towards it. You know, you don't get a moment like at the end of the, uh, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, right, where, where Aslan comes out and explains things a little bit more clearly about his relationship with Jesus and stuff. It, we, we don't get that. Again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a different approach. It's a different way. And I love, and I love the Narnia books. Me too. They're fantastic. Me too. Um, they're a different sort of thing. Absolutely. And I think that's part of the... Sometimes I think... Um, Tolkien and Lewis, because they were both inklings, because they were such good friends, sometimes I think in the public mind they can kind of get compressed as if yes. they were the same. They're yes. very different. They're so different. <laughs> um, they're very different um, yes. in terms of their personality. They're very different in terms of their literary approach. Yes. Um, they're very different in the way that they engage with their reading. Um, and I think it's, it's important to distinguish those um, and then we can see and appreciate each one for who they really are. Absolutely. It's, it's almost ironic the way that they get sort of packaged as if they were doing exactly the same thing when, of course, they would have laughed so hard uh, to hear people talk about them that way, certainly. Well, I know we're, we're running late, and I want to make sure to get some questions from the audience. So are there questions? Oh, there's, okay, I think, I think the microphone is over on that side over there. There's a little, little spotlight over there, so if you, don't be shy. Go over to the microphone over there. <laughs> Testing. Okay. This uh, question is actually for Dr. Olson. Uh, and I want to preface this question by saying I'm a huge fan of your lectures and the minutia of your podcast. <laughs> So then that, that brings me to this question is why is it that, why do you think that Tolkien fans just love to splinter the white light of his universe? <laughs> and do you think Tolkien would find wisdom in it? Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's an awkward question sometimes. I, the, the one thing that I will say, um, one of the things that I love most about reading, especially reading Tolkien's letters, is I love reading his readings of the book. Um, when someone asked him a question about the Lord of the Rings, he didn't generally respond with, by sort of making up or saying something sort of authoritative, like, well, this is what is the real truth about Middle-earth. What he would always do is he'd go back and quote the text, right? And he would respond as a reader. And he'd be like, well, as you can see here, this, and, 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 and you can see he's, he's detaching himself from the text, not speaking as an author, he's speaking as a reader of his own text. And he was a really good, which is not always true of authors, he was a really good close reader of his own text, right? <laughs> so um, that's something that, the, it's the one piece of, I don't know if justification is the right word, but his own uh, attention to detail and the way that he loved to go back, even to go back through his own work uh, and look at it in detail. Um, it is true that I think that at times, one of the dangers, potentially, of Tolkien's world because of its level of detail and the way in which it draws you in imaginatively, and I mean imaginatively, actively, not only to appreciate the detail that he created, but to invest imaginatively yourself as you, as, as you read. Um, there is always the temptation to believe that like all of the answers are there, right? That, that world really does exist in every possible way and you, can, and you can find the answers. And sometimes I find people sort of shocked and appalled and we say like, well, we really have no idea what the answer to that could possibly be because it's just not there, you know. Um, but, but nevertheless, there is enough detail uh, 
for us to really enjoy speculating and stuff. So uh, I, I, I do think that it's a very natural reaction. There is sometimes, I think, perhaps a temptation to go too far with that. Um, not but you. You, I, you would never do that. No, I mean, not me, obviously. But, you know. So I, he'd be a fan of your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is for Dr. Ordway. Great. Question. Father Francis, who was his ward, was part of the oratory. Oratorians, that's an order that was founded by the Florentine saint, St. Philip Neri, who in Catholicism is the patron saint of joy, who strongly believed if you have faith in Christ, if you are true to your, your beliefs, you should have no anxiety. And many times in your presentation, your presentation, Mr. Olson, you both use the words joy, anxiety, and how important then, not only in being his guardian, watching out for him, you know, stay away from Edith for a while, study, get your scholarship, I'm gonna pay for you, was that whole concept of joy and surrendering yourself and how important that was. And I never realized that, and I think that was quite amazing. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that, bring that up because um, I think the oratory influence on Tolkien's um, formation as a Catholic is something that I don't know if anybody has really written about that or really, really thought about it, again, because his Catholicism has been a little bit sidelined, but um, the oratorians have such a great witness. And, you know, he was at the Birmingham Oratory, um, you know, and the Birmingham Oratory is founded, um, the oratory founded in England by um, Blessed John Henry Newman. Um, and so, again, a major figure of English letters. Uh, so another, you know, even that we don't know if he read Newman's works or not, but certainly he knew of Newman's influence, um, you know, through the, through the oratory. Um, and then when he was in Oxford, you know, to be a, uh, a worshiper at the Oxford Oratory, which is, um, the Oxford Oratory is a church of St. Aloysius, um, and it's, as an oratory church, it's, you know, under the patronage of St. Philip Neri. So again, you know, and there's a, there's a, a side altar with a, a big painting of St. Philip um, right there, and the oratorians make a big deal about um, the feast day, and, and it really is a joyful, a joyful thing. And I think that is probably a, a contributing factor in, in, his, in his Catholic faith, in the fact that you know, the oratorians make a, uh, a, major, um, a major part of their charism is hearing confessions. Um, it's something they do in, in Oxford, it's something they do in Birmingham, it's something they do in London. Um, and so they have a real sense of yet the reality of sin, the reality of failure. Um, they're not glossing over our weakness and our sin, but they're, they're saying, you know, you know, confess, you know, and then, you know, be freed from that and, and, and have this great joy of your faith. And I think that balance um, might very well have contributed something important to Tolkien's development as, as a young man, as an adult. Um, and and I, in one of his letters, he even, he mentions that Father Francis really taught him um, forgiveness um, and mercy. That's where he learned forgiveness and mercy. And I think that's particularly significant since I'm sure that the young Tolkien is a 10 year old boy, he would have understood the circumstances of their poverty. I can only imagine the bitterness he must have felt against his relatives for abandoning his mother and, and you know, the, the two brothers and having his mother die um, without proper medical care. And the fact that he could say of Father Francis that he learned forgiveness and mercy of him, um, I think he probably helped him get past that bitterness and to forgive, and then to be able to be a father and a husband to his own children, you know, to, to Edith and to his children. Thank you, thank you. Are we? <laughs> oh dear. Oh. We're gonna no. take one from the balcony. Oh, one from the balcony. Hello, great. Oh. Excellent. Hey, um, so Dr. Can I ask two? Would that be okay? Sure. Uh, first one is for Dr. Ordway. Um, I, another sticking point I've always heard when it comes to the compatibility of Lord of the Rings with Christianity is in addition to the reincarnation of the elves, is the creative or sub-creative capacity of the Valar. Um, just because it seems like Tolkien is giving the 
angels or his angels a sort of creative capacity that it doesn't seem like the Christian tradition does give them. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first question. Uh, the second question would be for any of you. Um, it's something I've been thinking about a long time with reading The Lord of the Rings is that, you know, I'm drawn to this conversation. I can't remember exactly where it shows up, but it's between Gimli and Legolas. And Gimli describes how what the, el what the dwarves do with the caves is not, it, it, it's, it's, it's equivalent to what the elves do to the forests. It's not a matter of going into the cave and robbing it of its resources. It's a matter of almost... Uh, unearthing the beauty that's already there. And that's, I think, kind of a, a sense of what subcreation is in general, allowing what's good, true, and beautiful in creation to, to emerge, to be unconcealed, in a sense, to be disclosed. But he has this real clear sense that there's a distinction, a real, he believes in a real distinction between what the elves and the dwarves are doing in subcreation and what's happening in Isengard and Mordor, between this, this industry, this ravaging of nature versus unearthing nature. And it seems like in, you know, in the contemporary world, we, we let those lines, they're so blurred, right? I mean, in questions of like natural law that come up in Catholic ethics, you see this all the time. Like, well, when is a medical procedure something natural? When is it healing versus when is it manipulation? Or can we say those two things are even different at all? And so I wonder why this sense of this real distinction between the two, uh, what's natural and what's not, um, you know, I wonder, where, where that's coming from and, and how we can maybe pull from that a little bit in the contemporary world. Right, yeah. Well, um, so to start with the, the first question, um, I think it's important when you think about Tolkien's, you know, his vision of Middle Earth, that he's, he's not just retelling the Christian story. I mean, he is, he is sub-creating. And so I think it's a mistake to try to map too closely on because, for instance, we look at the creation account in the Silmarillion and we have um, music. Um, and it's wordless music, but you could say, but wait, in Genesis, it's God said, and there's the word by, it's through the word that all things were made. So is it, you know, is it not the same creation because it's music versus language? Well, I think that would be to kind of miss the point of, of um, the way that he's reimagining it um, because simply to retell it is not what he's out to do. He's, he's imagining this creation moment in a new way. And so in his, in his vision of creation, um, he has his angelic powers participating. Um, and there's nothing in that that is contrary um, to Christian thinking. Um, I mean, the, the angels are, are messengers, they're doing things. You know, they could be doing more things than, than we know. Um, but I think mostly it's just he's, he's imagining this um, with the scope of his own creative freedom. Um, and note, though, that it's very clear that the, there is the creator, and it's from him that all this creative power ultimately comes. And I think that's the fundamental premise that's consistent with Christian theology. Um, how he imagines it, you know, is, 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 the, is just his imaginative, his imaginative play. And I think with, just to address briefly your, your second point, um, I think indeed that the question, it's always, it's always difficult in this fallen world to figure out how to apply clear cut principles in one's actual lives. That's, that's hard to do. Um, but I think Tolkien, he, he doesn't make Middle Earth quite as black and white as sometimes people, people think it is. Because even the very fact that Legolas is anxious about what will the dwarves do to these caves. We see there this sense that, yeah, the dwarves could go wrong. And we see that in Moria. They delved too deeply. And they reached things that shouldn't have been disturbed. So we do get the sense that, yeah, it's tricky to discern where the limit is. And sometimes, even in Middle Earth, sometimes they go wrong, as, as do we. Um, and that's why we have to you know, <laughs> admit our failures and, and repent. <laughs> Well, I know that it's getting very late. Yeah. yeah. One, one more question? Okay, great. Don't you think it's somewhat disingenuous to pose this as fundamentally Catholic or even fundamentally Christian work? I mean, what about the pre-Christian sources that he was using, the Old English? And you'd call it pagan, of course, but it's pre-Christian. Germanic, the Kalevala, the Finnish. I think you're really minimizing that. Ah, see so this, sorry, this question is near and dear to my heart because I'm working a book about Tolkien's modern sources. Um, so the question of source material, I think, is a very important one. 
Um, and I think it's very important, exactly as you say, not to minimize the other sources that he's using. He is very clearly drawing on pre-Christian source material, on the myths, the sagas, all of that, absolutely. Um, but it's Tolkien's own word. It's Tolkien's own word that he says is fundamentally religious and Catholic. And so, hold on, um, and so we have to say, well, what do we mean by that? And I think by fundamentally, I don't think he necessarily means well, he certainly doesn't mean only. He would himself admit that that's simply not the case. I think he means at its essence um, that there's, a, there's an aspect of it, that an irreducible element um, that, is, that is Christian. Um, and as a Catholic, um, he would recognize that anything that is good or true or beautiful, pre-Christian, pagan, etc., is good and true and beautiful. So all of that is open to him to draw on. Um, and I think that, that recognition of the good, the true, and the beautiful, that we can say that's a fundamental element in all of the source material that he's drawing on. I just think it's a little dangerous to start looking for Christ figures and angels. I mean, they're clearly meant to be gods, the god of the harvest, the god of water. Uh, we're not talking about angels. He's talking about... Nordic kind of uh, mythology. So that again, that was his word, uh, angels. Um, again, it's, it's uh, and he also, gods was also his word that he used for the Valars. He, called just, them, he also called them gods. This approach just seems to reduce him to kind of a propagandist. I mean, maybe a cryptic propagandist. <laughs> maybe not a crass propagandist like C.S. Lewis with the Narnia. I mean, <laughs> but... You know, well, in a kind of this, hidden way, and I, way I think, he, I think he was point. kind of, I think he was more than that. I think he had enough scholastic integrity to put his personal beliefs away when it came to kind of positing well, these kind of uh, cultural... It seemed, that, that seems to me a little reductionist to say that he's putting it away. Um, it, just to build on what Dr. Ordway was saying, I think that it's, it's much more the case that he wouldn't have compartmentalized in that yeah. way. Um, I don't think that he drew a great distinction. I've heard sometimes people, you know, sort of talking about, um, you know, imagining him as being sort of conflicted between, you know, sort of the Christian thing and his, the pre-Christian stuff that he did really love, right? And I don't think that he felt the least conflict uh, yeah. among those things um, and that they really were integrated very, uh, uh, very sort of firmly in his own mind and he was very comfortable uh, he, that, that his world was broader than all those things. Well, we would, we would like to wrap it up quick, definitely. I have one woman who has a pressing question about pressing Gollum. A Gollum. About Gollum. <laughs> Some things are important, absolutely. Gollum is very important. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Thank you so much for having explicated like the background of J.R.L. Tolkien in a way that I've never thought about before, having grown up on him and C.S. Lewis, but like not with as much of a religious background. So thank you very much. And I found it very easy to, I guess as someone who's not familiar as much with Catholicism, particularly Orthodox Catholicism, um, to fit the Valar and the world of the Silmarillion and the elves into this universe of sort of almost, I'm not going to say simplistic, but there's good and there's evil. Where do you put Gollum? Mm. Because he saves the universe, literally. And he didn't mean to get that way. <laughs> so yeah. I'm curious where, in a Catholic viewpoint, which you're clearly coming from, where does Smeagol land? And in what degree do you have pity, sympathy, empathy, in what degree do you have judgment? Where does he yeah. live at the end of the day? Oh, oh this is I, such a great question. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. This, and this is, this is a really, this is, is a very insightful question. Um, because um, Gollum, first of all, we see that he has succumbed to temptation. Um, and so the, in that sense, he's a very human figure. Um, we, can all, we can all be Gollum. You know, in the things that we want, we want it, yes. How many things do we say of that? And then we see the way that it diminishes him. And this is a very Catholic understanding of sin. It weakens us, it harms us, it, 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 just, it erodes our humanity. 
Um, so we see basically Gollum who has been weakened by this. Now, he is a figure who could be redeemed. And Gandalf yeah, is- I never necessarily saw it as sin always. Sometimes I saw it as a disease. Well, I think that's, that's the interesting thing is once we get into the habit of it, it, it's, it can be, it can be like a disease. Um, Smeagol is, is stuck in his rut. He has gotten himself into it by his own act, but then it kind of feeds in itself. It's a process. But Gandalf is very clear that, that, that Gollum could be redeemed, and he wants to give him an opportunity. Now, here's the very important role of pity. Um, Tolkien says that, that pity is at the heart of Lord of the Rings. Um, and there's one point in Lord of the Rings where Frodo says, oh, it's a pity that Bilbo didn't kill that wretch when he had the chance. And Gandalf says, no, no. Um, it was pity that stayed his hand. Um, pity and mercy, not to strike without need. And Frodo is basically like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> but then we find, ultimately, um, that it's because of Bilbo's act of pity on, on on, on Gollum, that when Frodo himself fails, because Frodo fails, Frodo fails at the, at the moment of the, of the completion of the quest. His will has been broken, um, and he, can't, he cannot do it. Um, and it's because of his pity, and Sam's, on Gollum, that providentially Gollum is able to save the universe by, by this action. And so we have here the sort of the workings of providence, mysteriously working, but working through the exercise of pity. Um, and we do see a moment, and, and it's a great tragedy, Gollum, because we see a moment where we almost think that maybe Gollum could be redeemed when we have him, he's looking at Frodo and Sam when they're, when they're sleeping, and we see that moment when he becomes like the wiz wizened old hobbit and he reaches out his hand and Sam wakes up and he thinks he's pawing at Frodo. He says, get away, and, and that's, that's that. And what a heartbreaking moment of you know, the, the lost, the, lo the lack of charity on Sam's part at that moment. And from a character who in every other respect embodies love. Exactly, and again, this I think goes to show that you know, far from being a, a writer of two-dimensional characters, um, Tolkien wrote very, very Absolutely. richly developed characters. So I think we see in in Gollum and in the reaction of the other characters a really a, a, a deep meditation on sin and redemption and the way that redemption plays out beyond our reckoning and the role that pity and mercy fundamentally have to do with our own salvation. But you're also right, there's also another layer of complexity on top of that, because there is also an external force acting on him, right? He well, did not is. completely all... corrupt himself. Yeah. No, he did not. And, and in a sense, one might say the capacity for Smeagol to pity anyone else is, has been robbed has from been him. Has been robbed of him, yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. He, he wants to reach out to this person, but it's right. been taken from him by something that he has no control over at yeah. the time. Yeah, no, and I agree. I was going to say exactly what Dr. Ordway was saying, that um, you know, when people talk about Tolkien's characters being all very simple and black and white, Gollum is a wonderful answer to that because he is such a complex and uh, 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 tra deeply tragic. He's also a villain. He eats babies for crying out loud, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, he's, he's just, in, in some ways, he's just as bad as can be, and yet we as readers also can't help but pity, just as Frodo finally comes around to pitying him when he sees Gollum, we can't help but pity him either. It is, uh, he is one of the most remark in this way, I think, one of the mm. most remarkable characters uh, in all of the Lord of the Rings, especially thinking about how he grew out of the much simpler character, yeah. uh, you know, sort of monster under the mountain, right, in, in The Hobbit, and to see what happens to him and with him. Uh, in The Lord of the Rings is just an amazing journey. Again, to see uh, Tolkien's journey of discovery as he learned more about this character. It's a, it's a, it's a fantastic question. Very right to focus in on Gollum. Um, well, I, I do know that we, we, we want to let you go before the icy breath of Karathras <laughs> freezes all the roads tonight. Uh, so I just want to thank our speakers once again.